And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Today I want to dive into a review of Andy Stanley's book, Not In It to Win It, Why Choosing Sides Sidelines the Church. Now, uh, this is the first time that I have done something along these lines on the podcast. So I wanted to explain uh, why I'm digging in. Now, the podcast is dedicated to equipping Christians to confidently, faithfully live out their faith in public life so the gospel advances, so biblical principles are brought to bear, and that leads to true human flourishing. So I don't often kind of look at other people's works. We're, we're busy about how do we do the work well. Uh, but I have had a number of conversations as of late on this particular work, uh, not in it to win it. And because of having a number of those conversations, I thought, hey, there's probably other people thinking about this. And we're, we're headed into election seasons season in earnest, though there is that question, did it ever end? Uh, but we're headed into election season in earnest, and a number of church leaders, ministry leaders are asking that question, how do I lead well in such a divided moment? And any search on that topic, not in it to when it's going to be up towards the top. So that'd be helpful to, to jump in and kind of give some thoughts on this, as I know a number of folks are reading the book, talking about it. Uh, the other reason I wanted to, to dive into this topic today is that not in it to win it is, in a sense, a stand-in for an entire argument about how Christians should engage in public life. And when I'm speaking to audiences, I'll often explain kind of the three uh, particular ways that, that Christians engage. There's kind of the embattled approach, uh, and I, I'm summing up a lot of a lot of a movement here. But in a sense, things are so bad we have to engage in in political life even jeopardizing biblical principles for short-term political gain. I don't think that's what we're called to do. I also don't think that we're called to be an exile church, to kind of say, hey, if we engage at all, we're, we're going to be jeopardizing our witness, and, and therefore this is dirty, let's just step out. And I think Andy Stanley's book, you know, no surprise, not in it to win it, <laughs> why, uh, why Choosing Sides Sidelines the Church, I think you can kind of guess the thesis or where the book is headed. And so if you are a Christian engaging in public life, as a citizen, and you're probably having some of these conversations uh, with folks about, well, why do you do that? And I think Andy Stanley's an, a great communicator. He He's put pen to paper on a lot of those arguments. So it, in a sense, is a, a stand-in for discussion about that entire way of engaging in Christian citizenship. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful, especially as we head into election season in earnest, uh, to jump in there. Now, uh, before I get into the meat of, of my review, I did want to mention, I, I do my best to be an example of conflict resolution. Now, I don't always get it right, for sure. You can ask people in my life, I, I definitely don't always get it right. I do try. Uh, and so this is not a situation where maybe it, a, an individual has offended me or said something about me directly. Uh, that's not the case. If that were, I would just go to them personally as prescribed by Matthew 18. Rather, this is a public work. Uh, these are ideas that are, are being discussed in the marketplace of ideas in the church generally, and I'm simply responding to those. Uh, we will send a note once uh, this is kind of formulated and, and packaged up uh, to Andy Stanley's ministry, and I just say we hey, we'd welcome to have a conversation about that. I I don't know, given you know the responsibilities he has, that there would be an opportunity. I, I would love to share how there are Christians uh, doing our very best uh, to follow Christ's example, but also you know we're, we're trying to be engaged in public life, um, and so that's that's my attempt. My my review here, I'll do my very best to be respectful as well. I framed it, and if you know, if you're familiar with the sandwich method say some good things, raise some questions, and say a good thing. Uh, and so I'm doing my very best to be respectful, but I, I do think these are important ideas. And Andy Stanley certainly has uh, an influence in, in the church, though I think in the last few years there have been questions raised about some of his stances for sure. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that uh, with Aaron Wren recently. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I am I'm trying to model that as well. But because this is in the public domain, I think it is something that we should be able to dive into. All right, so let's let's jump right into this review. Let me give you a couple things as I read uh, the book, as I listened through it, um, some things that, that definitely came to mind. And kind of here's my uh, general summary, and then we'll, we'll dive into all of it. Uh, in, in a sense, I think Andy Stanley is encouraging Christians to, in a sense, sit on the bench uh, when it comes to political life. Or, and I'm using the, the analogy from the, the subtitle of the book, Why Choosing Side Sidelines the Church. <clears throat> so in a sense, sit on the bench, sideline yourself, because you can't play the game without wearing the jersey of one of the teams and running their plays. But I, I do think that what Scripture is encouraging us to do is to get in the game, uh, 
but to wear Christ jersey and run Christ playbook. So don't just sit on the bench, rather go be the model player, especially if you're a leader and people are watching you. And so uh, I, we'll, we'll jump into all of that, but that's kind of my initial takeaway or summary. So here are a couple of important reminders that I did appreciate um, from Andy Stanley as he jumps into the book. Uh, the first thing that I would say is that he does focus on the church's mission. And he reminds us that the, the Great Commission is the church's mission. He goes on to say a church leader that's publicly aligned with a political party has relinquished his or her, his or her ability, talking about just a, a leader generally, to, to make disciples of half of their own nation. Uh, and so that's something certainly to, to think about. If we are very overtly partisan in the way that we lead, uh, are there people that maybe you're trying to lead to Christ that just pursuant to their perception uh, may may not come to church? Uh, now, does that mean you don't stand up and, and say what Scripture has has to say? No. But I think those are are some questions that it's healthy to think through and, and also to be reminded that the, the church's mission is not to save America, but it is to save souls. Um, and he goes on to say, what do we value most, winning souls or winning elections? And so the Church of Jesus Christ, its its mission is the Great Commission. Now, we'll I'll go further in just a minute into where I think he stops short in, in actually reviewing the whole Great Commission uh, and, and the, the command to make disciples. But that is a healthy reminder for us. As we head into election season, there can be a lot of hand-wringing about the future of the United States. And I am certainly burdened uh, about the future of the United States. But as followers of Jesus, our allegiance is to Christ and to his kingdom. And we can't lose sight that the, the church is an institution. Its mission is not to win an election. It is to fulfill the Great Commission. That That is a good, solid reminder at, at, in the moment. Another thing that he brings up I think is important is that our allegiance is to Christ and, and not to a partic particular political party or particular candidate. He goes on to say in the book, our actions may not clearly show what we value most, but our reactions often do. So what do we value most? Winning? Uh, winning souls or winning elections? And sometimes in public life, we can get pushed and pulled by allegiance to a particular candidate or to a party or a particular view of, of the United States um, rather than to Christ and to his kingdom. And so our allegiance always has to be to Jesus um, and to his kingdom, to the church as a follower of Jesus. And that is our foundation as we, we walk into public life. Uh, something else that I think he, he emphasizes that and gets right is he, he raises questions about the use of some of the Old Testament conquest language in our public advocacy. And specifically, the conflation of the, the covenant that God had with Israel and its application to the United States. Now, I've, I've, talked about this before. And I think one a good example of this is the use of 2 Chronicles 7.14. And so just let me read that passage to you. Uh, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, this is verse 12 in, in 2 Chronicles 7, and said unto him, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. So this is Solomon dedicating the, the Jewish temple. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people... Now he's speaking about the Jewish people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. Verse 15. Now my eyes shall be open, my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place in the temple. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be here or there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Uh, so that is very clearly a, a promise made you know, to Solomon and to the Jewish people. Uh, it's right there at the dedication of the temple. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this verse used in the context of the United States. Now, I, if you're a pastor that's used this passage a good bit, I, I'm not here to, to criticize that heavily. I'm just saying I, I do think we should be careful about context. And, you know, well, what does that mean? Like, my people who... Who specifically is God talking to? Who specifically is, is that promise given to? Um, instead, I, I just recommend you use Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 7 and 8. It's basically the same principle, but it is for all nations. So at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down and destroy it, 
If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from the evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So essentially, it's, it's the same pr uh, promise. If you repent, uh, then I will turn from the evil. I will bless you, in a sense. And so it just comes back to being careful about th there was a covenant in between God and the nation of Israel. There's nothing in Scripture that says that the United States is a covenant nation. So I do think it's important. He, he talks a good bit about uh, the, the Old Testament law and Moses. He says, look, Moses is not our guy, um, and that we have to be careful about conflating those, <clears throat> those two, uh, the, the covenant with Israel and the United States. So I think that's well taken. Uh, however, I, I'll get into where I think he, he takes it too far. So again, just a couple of things. That I, it's important as we head into election season, remembering that the church's mission is the Great Commission, not necessarily to win an election. Um, our allegiance is to Christ and not towards a particular party or candidate. And we've, we've got to prioritize our church family over perhaps a sociopolitical tribe or, or an allegiance to a political party or candidate. Uh, there certainly was a lot of that in 2020. We've talked about it a lot on the podcast. And then the covenant with Israel and its application to, U, to U, the U.S. Let's be very careful about applying Scripture and, and not conflating those two things or just using kind of the conquest language in the Old Testament um, in some of our, our public advocacy. I think those are, are great reminders, and they're well taken. So now on to uh, some questions. And, and I have framed them in the form of questions. You've had a chance to, to talk with uh, Andy uh, Stanley about these about his book, about the chapters. Uh, these would be the questions that I would raise. So the first question would be, what about the Great Commission's command to make disciples? All right, so he says, look, the church's um, mission is the Great Commission. I, I agree with that. Um, and he, he goes on to talk about, the, he has this statement uh, where he's, he was talking about unhitching the New Testament from the Old. He, he talks some about that in the book, saying that he was specifically referring to some of the, the covenant language. Uh, but here, I think he takes, he takes this too far. So he, he says, look, the, the church's uh, mission is the Great Commission, but well, what is the Great Commission? <laughs> it, it actually is to make disciples. So a couple of other statements that he makes in the book. When our Christian faith is reduced to belief, we lose our voice. He is not just the forgiver of sins. He is the Lord of our lives. And I would say absolutely amen to that. But then he goes on to say, Jesus has not come to upgrade or fix something. He came to rule in our hearts and reign over our behavior. So we're not in it to save America. We're in it to save Americans. So not in it to save America. We're in it to save Americans. So let me kind of dig back just a little bit. And one of my you know, main critiques, probably not a surprise to anybody that's followed Andy Stanley and some of the general critiques uh, of Andy Stanley, is this focus on the New Testament without relying on the grant narrative of Scripture. And so if you go back into Genesis, um, in Genesis 126, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. <coughs> so there is the creation mandate to have dominion over the earth, and that true flourishing comes by following God's good design. We then go into the covenant with Israel and with Moses, and there's there's no indication in the book of kind of splitting ceremonial law from uh, from the moral law, as we still believe that the moral law uh, applies to us. We can't just go murder someone, um, and that that goes back to the created order as well. And so the, the grand narrative of Scripture is God creates man, gives us this creation mandate. He chooses the nation of Israel and holds a covenant with them uh, so that all the world would see, would come and see the glory of God. And then Christ comes and he dies on the cross, and opening the, the good news of salvation to the Gentiles, and then calls the church to the Great Commission. Um, but the Great Commission is, in a sense, a continuation of the creation mandate, and it's now saying, here it is in Matthew 28, in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. That's discipling them, discipling the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so, 
that's you know theologians out there pastors out there you could explain uh, this probably much better than i can but <clears throat> the great commission is is not a disjointed command it is something that continues the grand narrative of scripture and so the that call to dominion is now focused into the great commission not just to make converts but actually to make disciples and sometimes say the great commission commands us to go to all everyone everywhere everything that christ has uh, commanded us and christ had many things to say about many things including the role of government and the purpose was to make fully formed disciples so in a sense stanley's view of all right the church's mission is the great commission amen to that but his view in a sense limits the great commission to just making converts rather than fully formed followers of jesus making other disciples that then go out and impact their cities and so I, this is a drum i've been beating for a while i absolutely agree that the great commission is is the church's mission but let's not limit that to just making converts it is to help people be fully formed disciples including i would argue in their role as citizens so that would be the first question like what about that command to make disciples and uh, Stanley talks a lot about how, well, Christ is King, Christ is Lord. It shouldn't just be belief. Well, shouldn't we be instructing Christians in the way that they go and then in, interact in the public square, rather than the only thing that applies from our faith in the public square is uh, don't say nasty things about someone else. It's just kind of an idea that you get kind of reading through the book. It's like, yeah, our faith applies, but it it just applies in in not saying um, harmful or hurtful things about other people. Uh, but what about the the other parts of our faith that we should bring in? What is true? What is good from the created order? Uh, so again, that would be my first question. What about the Great Commission's command to make disciples? The next question that I would have is, <clears throat> what about government as a God-ordained institution? And as kind of a corollary, our role as citizen in the United States. So what about government as a God-ordained institution, our role as citizen? Um, and he suddenly goes into the, the beautiful story. If you remember the individual named Dylan Roof who had gone into a church and, and killed and, and shot individuals in that church. And just the, the heart-rending story of him coming out for a hearing and the family members of those that were murdered in cold blood. So many of them followers of Jesus, they're at a Bible study. And those family members um, going to the mic and publicly forgiving Dylan Roof uh, for killing their family members. It's a beautiful example of forgiveness and mercy directed at Dylan Roof. But and Andy Stanley does kind of mention this in passing, but <clears throat> the, the other aspect of that story, though, is that government didn't say, oh, okay, because the family uh, forgave you, therefore you have no sentence. There is a God-given role for government, which we've studied often in, in 1 Peter 2, uh, which is the first to punish evil. And absolutely, when you murder someone else, the state must step in and punish that evil, uh, but also to promote good. And the question of, well, what version of good or evil is government to follow? A, pretty clear from Scripture, since God ordained the institution, that it should be God's version of good and evil. And, and so Dylan Roof's story is a beautiful expression of forgiveness, but the other part of that, uh, story is justice. And the state's job is not just to for, forgive in the sense that there be no consequence, but to actually institute justice. And the cross is the beautiful example of that, right? That it's there had to be justice for sin, and so there had to be payment, but then there's also mercy. So you look even at the, the New Testament. You have John the Baptist telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to take another man's wife. Uh, Jesus calling Herod a, a fox. Uh, certainly talking about duplicitousness or deceit, but also that you know he's challenging the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who do you think you are? Paul and Felix, um, he's, he's talking about righteousness and judgment to come, and Felix actually trembles. And so <clears throat> there is a God-ordained role for government, and this book it really doesn't dig into that at all. It's just as if, well, here's the church. Our job is to be over here on the sideline, <clears throat> because we don't want to take a side that's going to jeopardize our witness. Like, wait, hold on, hold on a second. Like, government is a God ordained institution, and it's supposed to punish evil and promote good as God de defined it. And just pulling back from that, and like, we don't have anything to say there, or it's going to jeopardize our witness. I, I don't think that's that's accurate. Also, what about the Old Testament? Uh, 
individuals like Daniel and Esther, Nehemiah. We've talked about John the Baptist. We've talked before in the podcast about Paul's use of his civitas, Christ's, again, critique of Herod and Rome. These are all examples of believers engaging in government so that government fulfills its God ordained role. So it's not like, Oh, that's, there's nothing there. You know, we don't, we don't have anything to say about that. Um, Jesus often, he, he reminded Pilate again, he reminded Herod of their proper biblical role. And that I believe is something that the church should do. Uh, back to scripture uh, first Peter, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the King of Supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And so that's said in the context of government. The, the other thought here is that Christ did look at uh, both the Pharisees and the Herodians who hated each other but hated Jesus more and say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, unto God what is God's. And much of, of Stanley's analysis is done, uh, as is often done in these sorts of books, uh, about a, an authoritarian Roman state. But what about a participatory democracy. That, that's a question that you don't see in the New Testament because that's not where Jesus was. That's not where Paul was. But we do see examples of Esther and Daniel and Nehemiah. Uh, and when they had an opportunity to engage in the government, they did so. And so here in the United States, I've often argued that we are Caesar in the sense that uh, we have authority, and I would argue, therefore, uh, responsibility in our government. So that, again, there's just no application there. There's, there's no discussion about that particular issue. Um, Andy Stanley does make this one comment. And, and again, read the whole book in context. I encourage you to pick it up for yourself. But he does say, do you want to fight for your rights as an American citizen? If so, I will join you. But that's not Jesus's fight. And my concern for a long time is do, we should not separate our life as a follower of Jesus in our engagement as a citizen. That can lead to all sorts of problems. What, how, what about morality? What about my integrity? What about the biblical sexual ethic? Uh, so we should not separate these two things. And that's where, if you've got this exiled view, how, what do you tell people that feel called to, to run for government or to be more engaged in these things? And he certainly also goes on to talk about Bart Ehrman's uh, kind of the, his review of the triumph of, of Christianity, another book called Dominion, how Christianity has impacted music, uh, literature, art, legislation, uh, health care, the idea that caring for the poor is not beneath you. That's a Christian idea. So Christianity was the catalyst for the most monumental transformation the world has ever seen. Did that happen by, by Christians just sitting on the sideline and saying, all right, we, we, don't, got it. we don't have anything to say there? All of these things, uh, the tax exemption that ministries enjoy, the religious freedom that we have, it's worth more than a shrug. I think it is, it is something we're, we've been placed here at this time, and it is something that we should do our best to steward. So that's question number two. First question being, what about the Great Commission's command to make disciples? The next one, what about government as a God-ordained institution and our role as citizen? Uh, another question I might have would be, what about the church's role as conscience? What about the, the church's role as conscience? We know from uh, Matthew 5, we're talking about the kingdom of God, that we're called to be salt, we're called to be light. We have John the Baptist's example, speaking truth to power. We have uh, Peter's example of looking at those in power, so we, we must obey God rather than man. There's a good discussion in the book about the early church and how the early church transformed the Roman Empire, uh, and it's, it's truly remarkable. It's truly beautiful, but the early church itself uh, did not just sit in the catacombs and pray and worship. They, they were actually strong proponents of the sanctity of life, rescuing babies from the wild. Uh, they were um, they opposed gladiatorial games, the mistreatment of women in Roman society, and those views eventually won out. <clears throat> but here's what Andy Stanley says. This is one of the key, key lines in the book. The moment we step into a ring that requires someone to lose in order for us to win, we are no longer followers of Jesus. Let me read that again. The moment we step into a ring that requires someone to lose in order for us to win, <clears throat> We are no longer followers of Jesus. He goes on to say, Jesus lost on purpose and with a purpose. So it is not a war. He's talking about this culture war mindset. He says, we're not in a war, so lose cheerfully if fought against. That is not our fight. So again, he, he's strong about 
vilification. You know, uh, Christians should not be speaking nasty things about others. We should be respectful in our dialogue. I, I agree with that. I do think there, though, he's he's speaking to a subset of believers. He, he mentions Westboro Baptist and others on Twitter or X now. And I, I think there certainly is, there's a group of folks of that could could use that exhortation, right? But I do think that that's a, a smaller subset of believers. I don't. Most of the Christians I meet, as I'm speaking in churches, and, and I'm speaking anecdotally, uh, but speaking with other pastors and being at national conferences and listening to ministry leaders, uh, even think about your own context. I don't. I don't think that that's most Christians. All right. I think that's speaking to a small subset of believers. And, and what about those that oppose? the biblical sexual ethic in public life, or dismantling the created order, opposing the sanctity of life. So this this approach says, look, if we step into a ring and what we do requires someone else to lose in order for us to win, we're no longer followers of Jesus. And I don't, there's a question by John Stone Street. This is so powerful. He asks, does God's morality get in the way of God's gospel? Again, does God's morality get in the way of God's gospel? The answer is no. In fact, the gospel itself requires a realization of sin. And how does the world, you know, how is the world going to be convicted of sin? We know that the Holy Spirit does that, but it does that through believers speaking truth. And the church's role has always been that of a conscience, of the conscience. There's this particular figure throughout uh, the, the scriptures that stands next to the king. It's a prophet or prophetess. Think about Moses and Pharaoh, Deborah and Barak, Samuel and Saul, Nathan and David, Elijah and Ahab, Micaiah and Jehoshaphat, Ahijah and Jeroboam, Jeremiah and Zedekiah, Esther and Ahasuerus, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel and Cyrus, John the Baptist and Herod, Jesus and Pilate, and Paul and Felix. These individuals did not just sit there and sprinkle holy water on political machinations. They said, you know, Nathan to David, you are the man. And again, if government is ordained by God to punish evil and promote good, then who or what is supposed to be informing government of biblical truth? Well, it, it isn't going to be the local secular group. Um, it isn't going to be a political party. Rather, it is going to be the church, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the early church was a great example of this. Yes, they were known for welp- welcoming all people, multi-ethnic, slaves, women, uh, the outcasts of society. They were known for their care and compassion for the, f- the poor, but they were also known for their advocacy for equal human dignity, for their opposition to the gladiatorial games. And uh, as we learned from uh, Professor Sean O'Neill talking about early church history, that were, wherever Christians could engage without giving into idolatry. So if they had to become a senator, you'd, you'd have to sacrifice to the gods. And the Christians, of course, couldn't do that. But where positions allowed, Christians were engaged in the civic life of their cities. And so this, again, the early church is a good example of this. It is the church's role to be the conscience. And if it's, what does it mean? And, and again, this a question of if we step into a ring that requires someone to lose in order for us to win, well, if we're talking about, quote unquote, the culture war, and it's Christians speaking into public life saying, look, marriage is between man and woman. That's what's going to lead to flourishing. If it's, hey, we believe in the sanctity of life, and that's a baby. And as a part of our law, you should not be able to kill a baby in the womb. If, if that's requiring someone to lose, um, we're no longer followers of Jesus. So we, we just back off any statement about biblical morality and just let the culture run uh, with unbiblical ideas. Uh, it is a vacuum. In pu- it's, there would be a moral vacuum in public life, and it would not stay that way for long. And we talked about the rise of the religious left. Others would come in and form the moral conscience of our country. So what about the church's role as conscience? Um, and I know I've gone on for a bit here. I have just one more question that I, I would ask, and that is, what about Christ as king? So the a couple of the lines again, um, Jesus lost on purpose, but with a purpose. And, and again, I do, I do agree with, uh, with Stanley on the church's approach to public life. And, and here's, uh, we're going to get into that here as we, we think about Christ as king. He, Stanley goes on to say, Christians are burnt or were burnt because they refused to put allegiance to the state over, all, uh, over allegiance to Christ. And Christ played to lose so the other side can win. And we must lease our death grip or lose our death grip on winning politically. 
And so again, Jesus, you know, lays down his life. Um, he dies for our sin. And the, it's kind of this idea that because that's what Christ did, then we have to do so as well. And I do think this overlooks what, what about the kingship of Christ? What do we do with that? In other places, he says, look, Jesus Christ is Lord, and that our Christian belief, our Christian faith is more than belief. It compels us to action. Well, he meant to that. So a couple of, of verses in Revelation, he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Pilate asked him in, in Mark 15, too, are you the King of the Jews? And he answered, said to them, you say it. In Philippians 2.10, uh, I think this is an important verse. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, meaning that you know his death on the cross, and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, look at that verse in verse 9, or think, uh, listen to it, I would say. <laughs> Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And this is something I missed for a long time. I would, I would talk about how Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign as king. No, no, no. Jesus is reigning now. He is king now. Wherefore, God has exalted him. We talked about Daniel 7 in the Daniel manual about the, the inauguration uh, of Jesus Christ as a king of kings and, and lord of lords. He's ruling and he's reigning now, not, not in the future. Now, his kingdom is different, as we'll get to in a minute. His kingdom is different. It is here, but not yet, in a sense. It's not fully physically realized, but as Christians, we have to be careful not to say it Okay, I can't say anything about that. That over there, that's not something I should talk about. That's dirty. That's non-spiritual. No, no, no. Jesus Christ is king. He he reigns over all. As Abraham Kuyper would say, there's you know, not a square inch in, in all of creation that, over which Christ does not cry, mine. And so how do you apply that kingship? And I think it's it's more than a shrug. It's not, well, I'm sorry, he he lost, and therefore I've I've got to lose. I like I gotta put I gotta put down these biblical principles. And allow my neighbors um, to live under unjust laws so that I also am following Jesus is kind of the sense that you get. <laughs> and, and part of my, my critique here, I'm trying to do so respectfully, is that there's not a lot of practical application. It's, it's very high-level principles, not a whole lot of practical application. Of, well, how do I live this out as a state representative? Uh, how, how do I live this out um, as a, a Christian called to go steward my vote? Um, and to to give input on the laws that are going to impact the country. I'm I'm Caesar in a sense. I'm called to principal participation here. So there's not a lot of practical application. Um, so when we think about Christ's kingdom, it, it is that idea, Christ is king, can be taken to an extreme. But we have to understand, well, all right, if Christ is king, but his kingdom's different, you think about the Sermon on the Mount. I think this is a great example uh, towards the end of it. So seek first the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? How is it supposed to be lived out now? Well, as part of the Sermon on the Mount, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be healed, uh, hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So again, to this idea of, you know, we, it, it's the sense, and again, I, there's not a lot of practical application here, but I just kind of get the sense of, all right, step back. If we are saying strongly our beliefs about how faith engages in politics, it's going to jeopardize our, our biblical witness, and it's not our fight, and, and so let's just lose joyfully uh, It is the idea. Whereas, well, well, hold on. Jesus Christ is king. We are called to be the light of the world, and that light is to go into all places where to do the good works, and there's, there's nothing in Scripture that says that doesn't apply to government. Why would we limit the application of the light to this God-ordained institution? And, and that's essentially where I, I, I think is the crux of the matter here. Um, Christianity, biblical principles, applies to all of life. And certainly those that rule, we want them to rule justly in the fear of God. Uh, we want them to rule with wisdom because that's going to lead to flourishing. And there again is, the, I think, the connection of the whole biblical narrative of the creation mandate, to the encouragement to the exiles in Jeremiah to plant gardens, to seek the shalom of your city, to now the great commission of making disciples that go out and make a difference. So I don't see 
in Scripture this wall or a constraint of, of being able to apply our beliefs biblically in the public square. So I've, I've gone on for a bit there, and I think kind of pull it together that if, if you follow this, like not in it to win it, like, you know, exiled type strategy, we're essentially saying that Christianity is re reduced to a belief. It's reduced to making converts. And we just leave the door open for someone else to rule. And he, he actually says this. So Christianity, he, Andy Stanley actually says Christianity is reduced to, to belief um, in the approach that he sees a lot of Christians take. And if that's the case, we're leaving the door open for something or someone else to rule. And, and that's kind of my response is, uh, yes, exactly uh, why we should be engaged, why we should do so in a biblical way. All right, so I mentioned the sandwich method. Um, I, I've, I've talked about uh, some things that I agreed with. The church's mission is the Great Commission. Our allegiance is to Christ. And we should be careful about conflating the con covenant with Israel and its application to the United States. Um, and, and then I'll end here. Stanley at the end makes a call to unity uh, for the church. And he, that is Christ's last prayer, that we would be one. And he, he dreams a little bit about what would it look like in the United States if the church of Jesus Christ, those that call in the name of Jesus, were actually politically unified or were unified as a movement. And that is a, a beautiful thing and is a great reminder. I just don't think that unity comes through not bringing up biblical principles. Unity actually comes from speaking the truth, but with grace and respecting one another. So to pull all of this together, uh, Stanley does mention, and this is a great thought, that Christianity, the followers of Jesus, was actually a political terminology. Uh, it, there was like the followers of Caesar, the followers of Nero, the followers of Jesus. And so that was actually kind of a, a term, a, a derogatory term towards Christians, but oh, they're the followers of Jesus, meaning the following Jesus had real life implications in public life. And again, we've we've created all these little categories. All right, your faith can't apply here. And you got to keep it over here. No, no, Christianity applies to all of life. It turned the Roman Empire upside down in about three centuries, as we studied in the book of Acts. So a couple of conclusions here. Our purpose is not winning, but it is to be a faithful witness. It's faithfulness. It's stewardship. Our, our, our purpose is not winning over people and crushing them, but rather it is to win them over. We, If we do lead, if we are in government, we should lead like Jesus. And uh, Jesus even talked some about this in, in Mark about how the prince of the Gentile lorded over you, but you, it, for you, it will not be that way. I want you to be a servant first. What if our government leaders took that to heart? <clears throat> our mission is discipleship. Another thought, our mission is discipleship, including in the area of citizenship. Like, how are people supposed to act? And we're surprised when they act like hermits or Machiavellian devils out in the public square. Well, have we discipled them? Christ is king. Another thought, Christ is king, and his kingdom principles lead to true flourishing. We've been given, been given a remarkable country and freedoms to store. We didn't design those. We didn't pay the price for them, but we have inherited them. And that demands more than a shrug. We've been given a remarkable country and freedoms to store. That demands more than a shrug. And we are Caesar in our country. We are called to principled participation. Render to Caesar what is Caesar. What does our Caesar require of us as an American citizen? It requires our principled participation. And my greatest concern with this approach to public life, I'm not, as I mentioned, this Andy Stanley's kind of put pen to paper, but it's it's an example of a particular approach. Uh, this approach to public life plays into a platonic separation, you know, from Plato, a platonic separation of spiritual belief from application to real life and to all of life. And I believe that we're called to do all to the glory of God, that Christ is King and His rule and reign has real implications for us. Now we have to lead and and work like Jesus, but he is King of Kings. And so back to kind of my basic, you know, summary of, of the book is that this, this book, you know, it says, Hey, you know, in a sense, when it comes to politics, sit on the bench, sideline yourself because you can't play without wearing the Jersey of one of the teams and running their play. I, I reject that. And I believe that scripture calls us to live out our faith in every area, every day, everywhere. Christ is King. It applies right there in Washington, D.C., right there at the State House, um, just like it does in our churches and in our personal lives. So let's get in the game, but let's wear Christ's jersey. I well taken many of the things that he raises of doing it in a Christ-like way. And let's run Christ's playbook, 
So let's go out and let's be the model player. Again, this one, I, I took some time and was praying some over this of whether I should launch into it, but I, I do think it's impacting a lot of people of faith. And so I wanted to just give you a few thoughts on Andy Stanley's not in it to win it. I, I think instead, let's engage in a public life as an expression of discipleship and with stewardship in mind. We'll be back with you next week.